Welcome to Dominate, where we discuss strength and conditioning and much more. Welcome to another episode of Dominate Discussions today. Today, we're going to change it a little bit because over the course of the last few episodes, you guys have been asking tons of questions about training, about nutrition. So we've gathered all that, and today we're going to have Master Coach Clance answer a lot of these questions. Ready? Ready. Awesome, man. I was born ready, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so today, um, we've got a lot of questions about off-season training, and you know that right now, hockey, volleyball, these, uh, you know, these athletes are coming into off-season training, so they want to know okay. this information. So Sounds good. Let's get right into it, all right? What is the minimum amount of um, days a week that you should be training in order to get results? Based on my experience, minimum of four days you should be training intensely and three days in terms of specificity in terms of your sport, whatever skill work that you need to do. So to be clear, you should be training seven days a week. But in terms of strength training, speed work, so on and so forth, four days a week. That's how you want to structure your training. And for us, we like to structure the seven days a week and athletes, we emphasize for them to work on their weak points, things that they need to level up. Um, for, you know, hockey guys, it could be, you know, stick handling, um, so on and so forth. Fo football guys, you know, so wide receiver, you know, catch the ball, snap or long snap. So you get the point. Just work on those weak points on your off days out of the gym. Um, or you can double up, you know, have two, three sessions a day where you, you lift in the morning and work on your skill work in the afternoon. So it's okay to train like five days, six days a week? Every day is okay to train. Um, I like our athletes to train every day. But in terms of specific lifting, running, um, relatively intense work, four days a week. What time of the day is better? like for training morning afternoon evening that's a hard question the best time to train where your body wakes up uh, you should be ready to go is about 10 a.m 10 to 11 a.m and that's when we have most of our elite athletes and pros etc to train at 10 a.m um, that's when your body you know is ready to go uh, some people are very they're early birds they like to get in early uh, some people they don't work wake up till noon but in general, on average, you're ready to go about 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. So I find that's the most optimal time. You know, you get the best out of your sessions. Someone asked the importance of vertical jump. Vertical jump is just an indicator. Okay, hey, I can express power at a, quickly, you know. So I shorten my muscles. Ex, I can express my power, rate of force development very fast. So that is a very good in, indicator for a powerful athlete. But you can be powerful but you can be weak. So if I have a super powerful athlete, I know I need to work on strength and that will actually help his power because um, power is one of the hardest attributes for athletes to develop. So when an athlete is powerful, that's why a lot of teams check vertical jump because when you can express power, you're relatively fast, you're explosive, you're quick. Um, so you have the qualities or the prowess to be a good athlete. Mm -hmm. I mean, the common thing is people think that they need to lift and be super strong in order to express that explosive power. Is that true? or how That is incorrect. You do want a baseline strength. Research has shown double body weight, back squat will translate to optimal rate of force development. That's not always the case. But it's good to have those measures. We found the, what we've trained, we get our athletes to double ba body weight back squat. They have a better ability to express better rate of force development, better power. So that is like the, the holy grail, basically in terms of research, based on experiment, athletes. But that's not all the case. So you have some athletes that are not that strong, but they're, they're very powerful, very cool. And what we call is very efficient elastic components like tendons and ligaments. Right? And now you get them strong, their rate of force development goes up, power. So to be clear, strength is important. If you overdo strength, you get slow and you don't want to get slow. So that's why it's a very inverse relationship that you always want to pay attention to. Athletes get too strong, they tend to get too slow. One uh, viewer asked, you know, uh, as a football athlete, how do I get off the line faster? What exercise does this? Hands down, snatch and clean helps you express power 
helps you express rate of force development. That is, uh, helps you express first step. Um, there's a very popular saying by this great strength, uh, track coach, I think Bo Schimbeckler, and he says, you um, back squat for the start. So back squats are, squatting is important. So, and then you clean for the first 10, and then the rest is sprinting, okay? So if you break that down, back squat helps you overcome your body weight. That's why it's very important to squat double your body weight, okay? If you're 300 pounds and you're a lineman, try to squat 600 pounds. That uh, 272 kilos, bottom line. Full range, of course. Full range, yeah. all right? Ask the grass, okay? Then you try to clean, okay? Clean 1.4, 1.5 times that weight, okay? That is a, gr a great formula for amazing rate of force development, first up power, knockout power. Okay, so getting off that line fast, working out those, those numbers will help you. So just to be clear, uh, when you say clean 1.5 times, if he, he was a 300 pound lineman, mm -hmm. you're, you're essentially saying uh, cleaning 450 pounds. Yes, right? So that 450 pounds, like, so saying that's a big dude, mm -hmm. right? But so when I say 1.5 to 1.5, so you okay. can, so you can, you know, hey, you have guys clean up five, cleaning 400 pounds, fast, quick, amazing, very explosive. So um, those are the numbers you work up to. You, you don't have, you know, 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4, you can see. So don't get it twisted. There are, there are guys that are actually cleaning that, that much weight. So someone asked, what is periodization and how is that applied to training? So periodization, the first book I read was by Tuta Bampa, was a famous, I, I feel, Eastern European uh, strength coach or sports scientist. And there's different methods of periodization, but the most common periodization is you're planning on whole cycles. It could be a six-month cycle or annual, annual cycle or a year or a multi-cycle. Be one, two, or three years you're planning for. Breaking it down, you go block by block. You go by a month block or a three-week block. And so you would have phase one, which is GPP, which they call general physical preparation. Just get in the body work so the, the work is not too specific. You basically get into shape. Then the, so that may last for, depending on the periodization model, it could be last for a month. It could last for three weeks. Or then you go into phase two. What do you prefer? Like a month, three weeks? Is there like a... it, it depends on the athlete. It depends the more advanced the athlete is. You shorten the phases. Like I have athletes that I change their... They're, I change their periodization every week. So every week they're doing something different. I have other athletes in general because of, you know, mental like boredom and so on and so forth. Um, within our system, we don't do the, what we call um, the general periodization model. Ours is, uh, is different. But for the periodization model, you will focus on basically one quality at a time. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between the periodization model and our model. Our model is something like a conjugate model. We work on all different abilities and qualities within one block, okay? So a periodization model will separate those blocks. So first, so I'll, I'll get back to GPP, general physical preparation. Second phase, uh, three to four weeks of hypertrophy. Third phase would be, uh, could be strength. Fourth phase could be power right? Then it could be fifth phase specialization. And then, then they will come back. The problem I found with that model is every time you move on to a new phase, you lose the quality. That's why I like the, what we call the conjugate, the conjugate model, where um, I think it was very, it was popularized in powerlifting by Louis Simmons. But the conjugate model is you work on all the qualities in every block, okay, whatever. So power, speed, strength, and you keep bringing those qualities with you in every block, okay? It's just that you kind of focus on a little bit more on a certain block, but you still do all the other qualities. You still doing all the other qualities, right? Uh, a touch of qualities, and so it, it depends. So for example, for us, we start off with structural balance, which is, even though we're working on structural balance, we're still working on rate of force development from day one. Okay, we're working on strength from day one. 
We're working on hypertrophy from day one, right? So even though the, the, the weight is low, the, uh, the lo load is low, only thing we don't work on is speed normally in day one, right. okay? Then the second phase, right, is when we start the AAS, one, where we work on strength, we work on power, work on hypertrophy, and some athletes could be like more hypertrophy than others, so hypertrophy means like getting, you know, putting on some size and so on and so forth, but power, and then we start our sprinting, and we keep those, so every phase we pretty much work on power, speed, sprinting, and then, you know, for hockey or football, we start on strongman, strongman for six weeks, so even though we go into another phase, we're still doing more power work, heavier lifting, we're doing speed, we're doing contrast training, and we're doing conditioning. Yeah. You see how all that work is? But the periodization model, the old model, wouldn't allow, that wasn't part of the, the and I found with the model that I use, in, in my experience, yeah. far better results. For those that don't know what um, AAS means, this actually means uh, Athlete Activation System, and it's a system that you've developed uh, for many, many years, and this is a system that you actually use at the gym. 100%. This is a primary system we use for all athletes. Someone uh, asked, you know, is unilateral work useful, and how do I use them in my training? Unilateral work is useful, and the way we use it is for mobility, flexibility, and obviously str uh, leg strength differences in, in, in in the, you know, in the different legs. So, and the biggest thing, we do a tons of split squats. We like that to, um, to prevent groin injuries, especially with a hockey player, work on mobility, flexibility in the ankle, hips, knee, um, uh, and get them more flexible in their psoas and so on and so forth. So we use that a lot in term, in, for our structural balance phase and depending on the athlete, if they need more unilateral work, we will continue doing the unilateral work through many different phases, so phase two, phase three. What I don't like and drives me crazy is these clowns walk around using all these unilateral work for getting athletes strong, which to me does not make any sense and it does not work. You need to use both legs. Why? To use more weight. Why? To activate higher threshold motor units. The body is very smart, okay? When you skate, you run, you know, uh, they say, okay, because I run on one, um, only one leg hits the ground, I should do one-legged pistol squats and this and that. And the, they're, they're all out of position, the ankle gets tight, and, so, and it just looks horrible in terms of mobility, flexibility, and getting stronger, okay? So you're actually doing a lot of harm to do, doing incorrect unilateral you know, So for us, we, we like step-ups, like Russian step-ups and so on and so forth, but we do a lot of squats, bilateral squats, double leg squats, double leg, um, you know, cleans and, and stuff like, and snatches, but we do not do uh, all these pistols and, you know, unilateral you know, work in terms of, we love lunges. Uh, we do a lot of lunges. Lunges are great. Uh, drop lunges are great. But what, and that is more for conditioning, more for flexibility, um, a little bit of strength. But if you want to get strong, you squat, bar none. Okay, there, there's, there's no replacement. Someone asked, what is the difference between strength speed and speed strength, and why is that important when it comes to training? Strength speed is you can use a higher rate, higher percentage of your max to, you know, so 70% and above mm -hmm. is classified strength speed, or say 60% and above. Um, speed strength is like 40%, 50 to, to, and below, down to like 30, 20%. And it's just basically rate of force development, high velocity work, it's important to use speed strength a lot because at the end of the day, you want your athletes to be quicker. And that's one of the tricks in, ter in terms of getting our athletes to have quick feet, be very explosive, is from day one, utilizing hip snatch, that's a way with the bar, and you know, athletes will use up to 40 kilos, which is 88 pounds, or some more advanced will use 50 kilos, which is about 102 pounds. And they'll do hip snatches and we typically prescribe three um, sets of, two to three sets of six. 
very fast, very explosive. And if you'll hear me screaming, speed, 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 that is strength speed because that is a low percentage of weight, moving that weight very fast. So for athlete using the bar, whether it's a female using a 15 kilo bar, a male using a 20 kilo bar, moving that weight very fast is key for speed strength. Now, as they start going heavier in their snatches and in their cleans and so on and so forth, they start getting to that strength speed quality. So marrying the two is key to have an all-around all athlete, right? You want to, because what happens is you have like a velocity um, disciples that just everything they do is high velocity, but they're weak, right? So they encounter some uh, uh, op uh, op opposing force that they need to apply some strength and some speed, and they can't. So they just get blown away. Right. So marrying that two is key in terms of if, if you're thinking contact sport, you're thinking hockey, you're thinking football and so on and so forth. And also managing your own body weight. OK, so if you really analyze our programming, we use speed strength every day and strength speed every day because our athletes get better. They're normally working anywhere from 760 to up to 90 percent of their max as frequently as possible. Got it. Makes sense? Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And you talk about using bars and weights and all that kind of stuff. What about the people at home? What can they do? Push-ups, sit-ups, chin-ups, um, hills, stairs, jumping jacks, burpees. There's no excuse to do something. Like, freaking get an old tire, 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 get a piece of rope, order from Home Depot and pull it down the street. I was doing sleds in front of my house yesterday. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't care who's laughing. There's always something to do, okay? Um, I know the parks were cut off. You couldn't use the parks. But now there's no excuse. I have athletes who are doing hills. I just got a video this morning of one of my football players where he, the gyms are closed. He's doing hill work. You run up the hill, do some push-ups, sit-ups, run back down the hill, do some sit-ups and push-ups. Jump. So, but how much of that do you need to do in order to, can you replicate that result? Uh, that you get from, you know, training in a facility? By no. Like, no, but you can be conditioned. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to be strong. Um, and I've been, I'm a push-up guy. I've been doing push-ups for years. And I just simply do a lot of push-ups. And one of my uh, coaches, uh, in, I seen him u utilizing uh, what we call these uh, uh, one, two, three, or pause push-ups. Basically, time on attention push-ups. Amazing for getting you strong. Right. It's just something that I'll, that just slipped me over the years. I use time on attention with weights and and so on and so forth. But it's all kinds of just mastering your body weight is what I'm trying to say yeah. is I feel that most people are not doing. I believe it should be a prerequisite. You mastering your body weight before you even start touching weights. You're like, you know, you should at least be able to knock out 50 push ups before you start using dumbbells, you know. You should at least be able to do 12 chin-ups before you start doing chin-ups. I'm not joking. Before you start doing pulls, I'm not joking. Like, those are the goals. Like, those are, those are, should be the primary objective. So when I hear that, oh, I don't have any weights, I don't have any, it kind of, it's just kind of laziness. Just do something. Get up and do something. Just exercise. Um, and I know, just try to feel good. You know, set a, for example, for push-ups, chin-ups, do them, do them every day, you know. Um, for hill work, structure it two, three times a week, for example. Get yourself, you know, start maybe once a week, then you build it twice a week, then maybe three times a week. You'll be amazed at what kind of condition you get in if you just get out and do it. And change is good. All right. Someone wrote, uh, I noticed your athletes do a lot of sprint work. Mm -hmm. Do you do that before or after working out and why? We do our sprint work after. We lift, jump, and then we sprint. That's our structure. Why? Because we're activating higher threshold motor units. Those threshold motor units are ready. They're awake. They're firing, ready to go. And then we do our sprint work for. And over the years, I found that that delivers the best results. I didn't invent it. I first learned about it by this famous track coach from Rice. His name was Carlos Lopez, who in turn learned it from a famous Italian sprint sprint coach back in the day. His name is uh, Victorio something. I can't remember his last name, but it works. And I've been using it for many years. It's tremendous because at the end of the day, most of our athletes, hey, our athletes who come to me, come to get strong, become, become more explosive. That's our specialty. 
and I found so far nothing beats that. Even of our track, I, we've had a, a bobsled guy. He came in national team, put 10 pounds on him, and he was faster. He was very skeptical about doing uh, lifting weights first, but he's found that it works. So we lift and then we run, and that's what we do. Um, obviously, if track is your priority, you don't want to do that. Most of the time, you want to focus on track. But weight training is just a part of the process. We're a small, integral part of the process. So if your priority sport is track, your priority sport is football, and so on and so forth, hey, there's going to be times where you're just going to run track, period, and then you lift after. But for us, lift first, jump, then sprint. Because it's a very effective and it's one of the fastest ways to get results immediately. Mm-hmm. Especially when, you know... We have a limited amount of time. Off-season. And, and for, for me, I've been, you know, and the biggest thing for me is just trying to Everybody wants results now. I want results now. So what are, what are the most effective way to see results as fast as possible? If you follow the system, you're getting results, period. The system is a system. And anybody we put through it, they get markably results. Someone wrote, I'm an older athlete. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm going to assume he's probably like maybe 25, 30 plus, maybe 35 plus, yeah, right? Yeah. How do I do strength training? Am I doing the same thing as a younger guys that are up and coming why not it's just different loading but why not do the same thing it's just the volume may be less Mm -hmm. it's just what tolerance can you handle and you can do the same thing because the same principles are the principles Mm -hmm. mobility flexibility get stronger you got to get faster it's just for your age and time how much uh, work can you handle and you know aches and pains and so on and so forth Ten, the problem with older athletes, they have a lot of other things going on in life. So stress becomes a factor. You know, paying the bills, mortgage, work, whatever. Sitting in front of the computer Sit, all Sitting day. in front of the computer. So those things that come into factor. Yeah. So generally, we have to cut down the amount of time that they focus on in the gym. But um, the athletes who don't have a lot of those, the older athletes who, you know, say national team athletes are a little older and so on and so forth, they're still in the gym. It's just normally as the older you get, the volume gets a little lower. But believe it or not, intensity is still high. So that leads to the next question is, how do you monitor overtraining? What is overtraining? Okay, overtraining is, I feel overused, overemphasized. Um, it's a reality. But what are biggest things I've understood over the years, and I was very careful of trying not to overtrain my athletes. I guess the best way to express this is in a story. I had this athlete um, start with me when he was about 14, 13, 14 years old. I used to be very strict with athletes not doing any type of extra work while they were training. But this athlete would skate before they lift. This athlete would skate after they live, obviously as a hockey player. Numbers kept going up year after year. He didn't think I was paying attention, but I was paying attention. I knew what he was doing. And I just seen the, the numbers don't lie. And then I started to allow other athletes to do the work. So sometimes the textbook doesn't match the reality. This athlete and many of my athletes have a tremendous work capacity to do work. Most of the athletes I train, train seven days a week. They do something, not in the gym seven days a week, but they're active seven days a week. Some of the football players, they run hills and so on and so forth. Um, so overtraining is, 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 uh, is something that's real, but what you have to do is make sure you monitor because sometimes if you don't want to stop training. You come in, you're extremely tired, start training. If you're training... So um, all of a sudden, your body just adapts and you're just hitting some new numbers. You have you just kind of switching. You're feeling good. Or other days you feel like shit. You just cut the cut the volume. Try not to cut the intensity. Do as much intensity as you can and cut the volume. So my point is you have to fight through that point. If you're tapering for a competition, different. And it's very difficult. I'm not saying it's easy to understand. Uh, like when I'm doing too much, because when you're tired, you don't want to wake up in the morning. Um, you don't feel like training. Those are part of the process of, of actually adaptation. Yeah. 
So you have to actually overtrain to get to a new level. If every time you come to the gym and you're smiling and it's, everything is hunky dory and you feel great, dude, you're not training. <laughs> okay, that's just a fact. And because everybody wants to be, you know, have a great training session all the time, we're actually having a lot of athletes who are not who are undertrained, therefore more susceptible to injury. Right. So. Um, it's not a, it's a fine line, it's not easy, it's something that you have to really pay attention to. And I know they have all these monitors, all these devices, all these things, and I've been paying attention to them. And a lot of them, they're wrong. Because the human body is so complex and the human body can take so much, people don't understand. I feel the data and all these, this technology has not fully, or not even close to understand what the human body can tolerate, adapt, and handle. And that's what I, fir I firmly believe. So to answer your question, sorry, that was a long answer. Overtraining is real, but you have to really pay attention to it and really understand it and be careful that you're not sacrificing progress, sacrificing adaptation, which I feel adaptation is not fully understood and utilized. So I guess that's why people, you know, hire a strength coach like yourself to actually see that. Yeah, because the mind will play tricks on you, man. The mind will say, I don't want to train, or body will play tricks on you. I'm sore, this hurts, and I ache, and the next minute you start lifting. Uh, yeah, I have elite athletes, as soon as they start to deload, or start, that's when their body starts acting up, because they're, they're regressing. Their body's not used to that. They need that work to actually get them into, you know, they need to keep moving. You know, it's because their, their body's so, function, so used to functioning at such a high level, right? So it's a very complex thing. Okay. Well, last question here. This is a question you always ask all your athletes when you interview them. What does dominate mean to you? Dominate mean to me. Very good question. For me, um, personally, dominate means whatever, like dominate is very personal to me because it's whatever you want to dominate in life. It could be a good mom. It could be, you know, obviously a great athlete. Yeah. And it could be certain things that you want to focus on to to dominate. So for me personally, I have things that I, I, I work on, you know, outside the gym and it's not easy. You, 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 you go your ups and downs and your ups and downs. And for me is focusing on that thing, whatever that is to, to you. Uh, so for me personally is really mastering a certain craft, like mastering my craft, um, committing to the, that mastery and executing that mastery every day, right? Certain components of my craft every day. And so I focus on things outside of my craft, a minimum of two hours a day. That's outside of everything. So a minimum, I focus, everything is locked off, on, and I'm in that two hours a day. My goal is to build that to four hours a day, obviously when I don't spend, uh, when I'm not spending as much time in the gym and so on and so forth. To me, personally, that, that's very hard for me. So it's no distractions, something very hard um, that's mentally challenging, that pushes me cognit cognitively hard for two hours a day. So, so that is my, to me, when I dominate that, in, you know, I probably never will, um, but I, I will try. So to me, that's personally fulfilling. So a lot of times people think it's, you know, it could be just, you know, you go to the, you want to dominate, comp don't get me wrong, I want to dominate competitions. But for me internally, per um, personally, it's dominating, sacrifice, being disciplined, being consistent. Thank you, Master Coach Clance. Yeah. <laughs> for you, all you viewers out there, um, if you got more questions for Coach Clance uh, for future episodes, drop a comment below or DM us on Instagram, and we'll see you next time on Domain Discussions.